Next, I'm going to uh, bring up to the stage uh, Fernando Mercado, who is right there. Uh, oh, perfect. Uh, you can turn yourself off mute uh, at this point, Fernando. Hi. Uh, we're doing well here. I think everyone's uh, enjoying the event so far. We're so happy to have you join us. Um, I am looking forward to our discussion here, and uh, I love your your branded, you know, outfit <laughs> and background. I have the water here, man. There. Oh, perfect, excellent. It's it's like uh, it's like we're we're in the restaurant. Uh, at, are you serving? Yeah, we are serving through delivery and drive through. So. We <laughs> Want to stop by? Excellent. Um, well, why don't you start off? Uh, you know, giving a little bit about your background. We just had Anne, who has transitioned, had a lot of roles. You have largely been within your organization uh, for for many years. I know. So, you know, why don't you kick off the, a little bit about yourself and some initial thoughts about this theme, the future of marketing leadership, and what are some of the key elements uh, that you feel that that theme is going to bring forward with people. Yeah, well, look, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it was very flattering to, to get the invitation. It's always a pleasure to uh, to be with you guys. Uh, it's hard, to, and it's a hard act to follow, you know, like we have had the chance to meet up like in a couple of like uh, events um, of the industry, the world is really small. I'm a big fan of the work that she does and, and, and the type of leadership that she brings to the table. So I I joined like just to do the tech check and I stayed uh, because of her, like what <laughs> Just awesome. So, um, well, you introduced me. I'm Fernando Machado. I am the uh, global chief marketing officer for Restaurant Brands International. Uh, we have three brands here that people know more the brands than the name of the company. Uh, so we have Burger King, which is the largest brand. We have Popeyes, which is a fried chicken brand that if you're in the U.S., you've definitely heard about it. Uh, and we have Tim Hortons, which is a quintessentially uh, Canadian brand, right? I mean, it's a powerhouse in Canada. We have an international presence with teams, and we have teams in the U.S. too, but it's really like quintessentially uh, Canadian. I have been here for about seven years, uh, here meaning in Miami, uh, and this year working from my virtual uh, restaurant here. Um, and, uh, and before uh, RBI, I spent 18 years uh, in Unilever, so I, I basically did all my career uh, in Unilever. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, but I was always like very creative. So I always bridged those two sides, which was actually one of the uh, one of the tips that Anne gave, and I totally subscribe to that. Like exercise both sides of your brain. Um, and uh, I did an MBA on INSEAD uh, at some point. I took a leave of absence and did that. And today I'm here to talk about the future of marketing leadership. Uh, and, and and when I think about that team, when I first read like, hey, future of marketing leadership, I think that my head went automatically on uh, uh, on like how the role of the CMO uh, evolved and, and continues to evolve over time, right? I mean, naturally, right? Uh, and um, uh, and it's funny to um, to think that because like uh, I think that if you if I went back many years uh, like down down the road, uh, I think that the, the 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 immediate association of like describing the main objective of a CMO would be to basically like uh, unlock demand and drive sales, you know? So it would be a much more like, I would say for the lack of a better word, like pragmatic straight to sales uh, uh, type of role. Uh, and every now and then there is a bit of a, like a hiccup at least from my perspective in the industry uh, and, 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 and they change the name from CMO to chief growth officer or whatever, which to me is like, yes, sure. It's one of the things we have to do and actually, depending on the industry you are in and the situation of your brand, it may be the most important thing you have to do. I don't think any CMO will survive uh, on the job for a year uh, or two years uh, if sales are not there, right? I mean, if you're not delivering against the objective, so definitely uh, you have to do that. But I think that over time, uh, the, the best CMOs I know uh, and, uh, and, and the best brands I know are, are the brands that started to to not just think about the short term, but also start to work to make sure that the brand was relevant five, 10 years from now. You know, like, so uh, it evolved to be more like finding the right balance between, yes, you have to deliver the short term. Uh, so it's like sales overnight uh, and brand over time, but we also need to prepare the brand uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be ready, right, for the future. Like, uh, 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 just as an example, like, we are doing a lot of work around sustainability. We are doing a lot of work around 
food quality, removing artificial ingredients, or like we are doing a lot of work in terms of defining how the restaurant will be in the future in a post-pandemic world. I don't think any of those things are going to dramatically increase my sales this month. You know, like, so, but if I don't do then, uh, I will fail to write that future. I will fail to uh, uh, to continue to invest on the brand so that it's relevant five, 10 years from now. Uh, and, and, and I would go one step further uh, uh, on the journey from sales to sales and brand. Um, I think that at least when I reflect about where I spend my time, uh, I, and maybe that's because I've been here for a long time. Maybe it's because this year has been like a, a very different year for all of us. But I, I find myself spending a lot of time in things that are related to long-term capabilities of the company. Uh, it's not even the brand. You know what I mean? Like, sure, like, look, I mean, my, my meetings this morning, I, I revised the calendar of activities for Europe next year. I revised the calendar of activities for Asia Pacific next year. So the day started quite early here because of the time difference. We got, but it was worse for them. It was 9 p.m. for them. So I really commend the guys for like being there for, for us on, on a Friday night. But, uh, but then it like, it, it's not just that, right? Uh, I, if I look at my agenda for this week, uh, I'm part of the diversity and inclusion steering committee for the company. Uh, I'm pushing big time together with other people, the agenda around sustainability, uh, around the uh, employee value proposition, like which like most likely if you read my LinkedIn may not necessarily be there on my, uh, uh, on, my uh, on the description of my job or uh, it's definitely not part of my job description. But I think that uh, uh, all CMOs, especially the ones that have the dream of being on a path to become CEO, which I think is the path that Anne uh, took, uh, you, you need to you need to invest around those things, you know. Like, and you can expand your role, yeah, uh, and layer more responsibility and, and and layer things that will cause an even bigger impact uh, for the company on the long run. I hope that ten years from now, when people look back. Uh, they will probably not remember which promotion we run in October, uh, but they will see the evolution that we did around DNI. They will see like the massive, ma massive change we did in terms of supply chain in order to remove artificial ingredients. They will see that we, we for the first time, we started to read our carbon footprint and are working to establish targets on that. All, all those things, I think, are could be part of marketing leadership. Uh, if you are able to uh, to expand your role, uh, and and I could keep going, you know, like I could talk about how uh, how CMOs are very becoming very tech savvy, you know what I mean, like and how they CMOs are helping bridge data and insights uh, and creative, you know, um, it, that, that's also part of our role. Let's let's go ahead and and piece some of those together because um, I think they are all very interesting. Uh, you know, one element I'm thinking of uh, in what you were just saying about the impacts on, you know, DEI, supply chain, all that kind of stuff, right? Not necessarily standard CMO roles. The brand center, we've had this sense of in building a brand, it's about breaking down silos. And I, I, I started 10 years ago, a little more uh, in this role, and I've seen that beginning to crack and it's still small. You're talking about this very specifically. How are you operationalizing that within, you know, any one of the brands or restaurant brands international that you as the CMO are involved in the supply chain related decision making that's going in some of these other big picture issues that the brand faces. I think we may be, I'm not sure if what I can, what I do here, it's necessarily easily replicable by other companies because one thing that plays in, in our advantage and in, 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 to my benefit is the fact that it's an organization that's very, very nimble, very transparent, where people collaborate very closely. You know, like uh, 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 it's very informal. You know, like this year, like it's it's hard to explain this uh, when everyone is working from home, but um, like there is not a single day I don't talk to my CEO or to my CFO or to my COO or to the regional presidents of the key regions that we have. Like we work very close together. When we are in the office, our office doesn't have a single closed office, zero. The CEO sits like two meters from where I sit. He doesn't have a room. He doesn't have a butler. He doesn't have a waiter. You know what I mean? Like 
He's wearing running shoes and jeans. Like he's like people like like us. So uh, 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 and that helps, you know, like uh, that helps like breaking the silos that that you describe, you know. Like so, for instance, if we have an idea about uh, uh, if you have a thought around uh, uh, our vision in terms of sustainability, uh, we very quickly we get together and and we discuss and we align. Uh, and if we agree to disagree, which doesn't happen that often, the CEO will make a call uh, uh, on that. Or he will push it down and say, like, guys, you guys have to figure it out. You're like, ah, um, right, bring me more arguments. Yeah. <laughs> but, but for instance, like sustainability today, the head of sustainability reports to me. Uh, uh, and, and the guys from supply chain who are extremely helpful and, and are doing their work, like, there is not one day that we don't speak. You know, and there is no such thing as like, oh, but I don't report to him, so I'm not. No, 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 no. Like we have, we, we define that as a strategic priority. Everyone has targets around that, and we work on that together. So, uh, like, if if I were to give a tip or advice, I would say, well, I mean, work to break down the barriers, uh, work to make sure that there are strategies aligned at the top, uh, and that you trickle down targets for people uh, that make sense, and they are shared targets so that people have to work together. That's great. And then following up on this other, and I think there are a few themes we'll take out of it, right? That sort of, let's start initially with, you know, the early technology, which is, right, what's happened over the last 20 years, which is creation of the internet and the massive amount of data and new interactions with consumers that's already taking place. So thinking about that, you are a brand known for creativity, especially for those in the industry. I mean, because of the early media you get, and it'd be interesting to talk about you know, where you feel customers are getting some of these things versus uh, some folks who are in the field um, in the marketing advertising industry and their impression, but you're known for that. So where do you create that loop, that data creativity loop where one is they are constantly informing each other? So for us, like uh, when I think about tech and digital, I think about ways to connect with my fan or with my target audience. And I think about improving the, the quality of the experience that people have. So year after year, for the past whatever, 10 years, uh, I think all brands have been investing more and more and more in digital, you know, like whether that's digital media, whether that's like digital capabilities or tech capabilities. Uh, and I think that this year we've seen a massive acceleration of that. Right? I mean, imagine this, like in many markets, uh, we had our dining closed, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so the restaurant looked pretty much like the one you were seeing here, no one inside. Uh, and, uh, and people wanted to do digital transactions because they are contactless, right? So mobile ordering payment, like uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a benefit, right? It's something that people are looking for today because of the situation of the pandemic. Like delivery has skyrocketed, right? I mean, uh, like I remember like, I probably could count like in, in one hand the number of times I ordered Instacart before 2020. Now, like I think I probably order Instacart every week, right? I mean, in Uber Eats or DoorDash or Grubhub, all those guys are growing uh, dramatically. Um, now, um, uh, like, so we, we do have, we, we probably like have more data than I would like to have. You know, like I'm exaggerating a little bit. I, I always have more data, but uh, uh, it's like, it's overwhelming. You know, and I think that all companies have that, you know, like uh, to some extent. Uh, we have millions of people with, that use our app daily, you know, like, so it's like a lot of data point. Uh, and, and I think that what, what, where the magic happens, and to Anne's point, like the, the, cross, the cross between rational and, 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 and the magic, right, and the creative, is what unlocks growth disproportionately. You know what I mean? Like, so examples of that, like when we launched mobile order and payment, we were not first to launch, you know, like it was something that other companies already had, other companies in our industry had. So we had to come up with an idea that would trigger engagement. And we did work for the tour, uh, which I'm not going to have time to show it here, but if you Google or you search on YouTube, what for the tour case study, you are going to see that. Like uh, in Mexico, we were struggling with growing delivery because the traffic jam is horrific. I mean, I don't know how familiar people are with Mexico City, but it's it's considered the worst traffic jam in the world, and and some people take up to five hours to get home. Uh, and um, uh, so we 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 partnered with the tech team and with the digital team, and we piloted uh, uh, delivery on, to the cars on the traffic jam. But like, wow. you will not be able to do that 
if uh, you were not trying to live on the intersection between data, tech, and creativity. And that's what we try to do, you know, like, again, like we break the silos, we talk to the tech guys all the time. Uh, they are part of, they don't report to me, but they are part of our marketing thinking. Uh, and, and, and even our marketing guys, they tend to be very tech savvy uh, because they know it's a priority to the company uh, and because they see that we can unlock huge growth when we get it right. That's great. Um, moving a little, maybe you can dive in a little into some of the creativity elements. I mean, I think this is great. You brought up, there was a question from uh, one of our longtime friends, Joanna Seddon, who's on today, um, who was asking about innovation and the role of the CMO. And I think you just brought that out of that integration between you know tech, innovation, we work together. Um, maybe not reporting in the Mexico example is great, right? Consumer need is there. There's a problem they're having. What can we do to help drive a solution for them um, was a great example. But, I, you know, it seems that and maybe even this is also a little bit about the international, right? You brought Mexico there. You know, Burger King UK made the news this week, right, for this promotion of please go order from any restaurant, right, yeah. um, in this fun sort of. Uh, little throwing shade moment that you guys have often with McDonald's, but it was a great thing. And there's, I mean, there's every week, it seems there's a brand of yours that kind of gets into the press or in somewhere around the world. How, yeah. do, how do you do that? What have you created as an organization to drive that kind of experience? I think it's, it's a journey, you know, like, uh, uh, and again, I've been here for seven years, um, almost seven now. And, uh, and in the beginning, it was not like that. You know what I mean? Like, I think that step one for us was to define what the positioning of the brand was, what are the values and personality of the brand, make sure that everyone understood that, or at least started to understand that. Uh, step two was like to align on the strategy, what we are trying to accomplish, what are the targets so that they're measurable targets uh, that we can chase uh, and so that we can track performance. Uh, and then, um, and then like uh, really like uh, um, in not just investing, but believing that that creativity can be a source of competitive advantage. Uh, and then in the beginning, we'll do maybe like one idea for the US and maybe one more market would do it. Uh, and then it would work and it would share the results. And then we did it again. And then it was again, just the US and maybe one more market in Latin America that would do it. It worked. Uh, and it worked even on the markets that didn't do it because the news travel. Uh, and, uh, and then when we did the third time, maybe five markets did, uh, and it worked for all of them. And then in three, four years, we were doing ideas in 40 countries. Uh, and uh, and it's you really need to build a culture, you know, like a, a culture of collaboration, a culture that um, uh, that uh, I hate when companies suffer from the not invented here syndrome. You know what I mean? Like just because the idea didn't come from you, you don't do it. Uh, and that happens a lot, to be honest with you. Uh, and, 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 but here, people are like cheering each other. You know, the idea that you mentioned from the UK is actually from France uh, and the UK. And then when it happened, we share, we have like a, a way to share, very technical. It's on WhatsApp. We have like a group of <laughs> 50 marketeers. Um, it's called the Gang. Gang. Uh, and, uh, and we share there. And then UK said, and I, I shared saying like, hey, BK France is doing this. It's awesome. I think it works well for countries in lockdown. I think it works well if you show support to small business, small independent business, not just the big guys. Uh, and, and maybe if you have a lockdown, you should consider doing it. And the UK did it immediately. And since then, we did it in like 20 countries, you know, like Mexico, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Germany, uh, France, UK. Uh, in, in US, it doesn't make much sense because uh, the restaurants are still open. So we really look into the context, we talk to the country and, and we make it happen. And, and everyone is proud, you know what I mean? Like uh, the, it's not because the Indonesia did, it's not because the idea was not yours that you don't do it. Like uh, they cheat each other, but again, it's a journey uh, uh, to get there. So today we have like a, a troop uh, of marketeers who are, is very passionate about the brand, who are very ambitious when it comes to creative because they know uh, creativity leads to a better result. And that collaborates all the time, you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, and that's just great, but it does take time to build that. Excellent. Let's dive for a moment into future technologies, right? Some are here, most of which are here with us in some level, 
um, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, right? All those could influence your business, right? One of your marketing campaigns, when we first met uh, very briefly uh, in Mumbai, when we were both speaking, you were yeah. talking about the, <laughs> the the playing around with uh, with Echo or with Alexa um, and your advertising campaign. So you've kind of you know had it on that end, used it as a creativity thing. But you know where are you seeing, you know where are you experimenting with some of these things? Maybe an example or two. Uh, you know, do you see, uh, you know, a robotic hamburger flipper as Wendy's, for example, uh, is beginning to, you know, experiment with in more restaurants? Not Wendy's, and uh, White Castle, I apologize. Yeah. No, it's all good. Like, look, um, <laughs> I, I think I we are always thinking about technology to, in to improve the guest experience, right? So we are playing with uh, suggestive selling. Uh, we are playing with... Uh, why, why, like uh, in the U.S., a lot of our business is through the through the drive-through, right? Mm -hmm. But if you think about the drive-through, it has not evolved much <laughs> over time, right? I mean, most likely, if you go to a, a restaurant, it will be the same speaker that was there 20 years ago. You have to scream, and you hardly you can hardly understand what they're saying on the other side. So it didn't evolve much, and it doesn't have to be that way. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so for instance, we are people don't think about that, but like we are installing thousands of digital menu boards uh, on the drive-thru, which gives me the ability to change the content dynamically, right? I mean, if it's a paper, I cannot do much, uh, but if it's a digital menu board, why don't I treat the, um, the drive-thru, the, the, that menu board almost as your cart on Amazon? You know, like uh, if, if Matthew added a Whopper, why don't I recommend a, 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 a Sunday? Because there is a high correlation you know what I mean? Like, a, yep. um, a why why can't I show you what was your previous order the last time you came? Uh, that would make your life much easier. You could just say, yeah, I will have the same as last time, you know, instead of having to customize the whole thing. Uh, we can make have it your way much easier uh, thanks to technology. We can have loyalty. We can have, like, we can do so much. We can do retargeting of people. Uh, so we are working on all those things, you know, and it's a mix of, like, it's a mix of AI, it's a mix of consumer understanding, uh, guest insights, uh, creativity, you know, like, so we, are, we have lots of initiatives that we are piloting, uh, fine tuning and improving to, to make them happen. Uh, we've done activations with augmented reality, you know, like we did one in Brazil, um, which was a, a promotion with augmented reality. So we, we always play uh, with new technology mm -hmm. yeah. we play for a certain purpose, uh, which is either to engage with our fan or to improve their experience. Great. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about, uh, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. Those issues are top of mind. They come around also into this overall, you know, sociopolitical future of what is the role of, you know, corporations and brands um, in creating, dealing with the themes that are changing in society how do you look at the risk reward elements there at Restaurant Brands International? Maybe you have an example or two of how you're trying to make change and where you're strategizing on the risk reward of those things. Look, I uh, I believe like one thing that I always tell the team, say to the team, and and I say to the to our creative partners too is uh, actions, not ads, or actions before ads. You know, like so. Um, like I'm very skeptical about um, advertising like that the company doesn't walk the talk on that same thing. You know, like, so I've been very focused for the past seven years uh, on making sure that we walk the talk on certain things internally, you know? Um, and by no means, I think we are perfect, but we have very clear plans and, and we have a very strong push from the leadership uh, on some of those areas, especially diversity and inclusion. I think that every person reacted a bit differently to um, to what happened this year, right? I mean, um, especially in the US. Like, I, I was very angry and like, uh, I, I didn't know, like, I think I was angry with humanity, you know, like, I, think I was angry with everything. And uh, in a, instead of like carrying that negative feeling, I decided to focus that and, and turn into energy to push even stronger to make a, a difference internally. So while before I was just trying to help, 
uh, I, I put myself in a position to be part of the the, the senior committee that, uh, that that's working on, on diversity and inclusion. I think we've made lots of progress on LGBTQ+, in turn, I'm talking about Restaurant Brands International. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we can talk about that, and we did several campaigns around that. Uh, we always do something on Pride Month, or, 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 or you know, like we did Proud Whopper. This year we did Pride Riders through delivery. We did uh, uh, Whopper Diamond. They were all LGBTQ plus campaigns. But then, like, we are 100% corporate equality index. You know what I mean? Like, so mm -hmm. we we walk the we walk the talk before we walk before we yeah. talk. Yeah. Right. Um, we did a lot of we did some progress, I would say, in terms of gender balance, which was for us a, a key point that we wanted to address. Uh, it's not the equal pay; it's it's more like having more women uh, at senior positions in the organization and in trying to understand why that th that process was not happened naturally. And I think I think we we always did really well with uh, uh, in Hispanic community, like uh, uh, having good representation. Of the of Hispanic, I think it helps that we are based in Miami, but we over-index uh, internally, and I'm talking about the corporate office. And I think we still have a, a long way to go uh, in terms of representation for from African Americans, you know, which has been the focus uh, uh, for uh, for this year. Every single person on the leadership team at RBI has a target around diversity and inclusion, uh, and that was not the case uh, before. So I'm very, and we made some public commitments around it. So. Uh, that's that's where my focus is. I'm working to create a pledge to all our partner agencies uh, to create targets on how we produce things, which type of casting we have. Because to me, like uh, that's where I can I think I can make the biggest difference. You know, I, I don't know if I I don't know if people need more awareness of the problem. You know, I think that people right. need like actions now. You know, and that's where I'm focusing on. You've talked about uh, some internal actions, which is obviously, I think, for many organizations, right? And even for most people paying attention to this issue, general consumers, activists, that's their favorite thing, right? Get started there. Are there actions you're taking? You know, one of the things we're also interested in is the partnerships, right? Uh, is Restaurant Brands International working with any other NGOs, community organizations, those kind of things to especially given the credibility of what you're trying to do internally and transparency about that, where are you looking at that partnership community effort? Like we, we do have partnership with lots of NGOs, it, not just on diversity and inclusion, but like uh, on sustainability. There are other areas that we also uh, look for partnership. Uh, I see, uh, I see the, uh, one of the strongest benefits of the partnership to, for us to learn, you know, from, uh, from others. I mean, sometimes we join round tables of a topic, you know, so that we can learn from uh, what other people are doing out there. Um, we, um, and, 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 and we are trying to like, like it's not an NGO, but for instance, like um, Popeye's over-index African-American as a consumer base, mm -hmm. you know, like, so I would love to have better representation of African-Americans in the marketing team. I would love to have better representation of African-Americans in the agency partners. Uh, I would love to have to only film with African American directors, to have more African American cast, you know, like uh, I think that that's where uh, uh, I can push uh, to to make a, a concrete difference, you know, like uh, for the brand and for the company and for the topic, you know. Right. Um, Great. Uh, reminding the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. I've seen some; a couple that popped up came up. I think answers came up in our discussion. Um, so, you know, one thing here, you heard it, uh, listening into the end of Ant's talk, right? We have a lot of students. This effort, as you know, is in partnership with our, our, uh, CBS Marketing Association of Columbia. Um, so anything to add or think about in another fashion to Ant's advice of what are sort of the skill sets, expectations, where do you see the next generation of leaders? What should they be thinking about, you know, in school and in their, in their young careers in terms of how to best yeah. potentially become a CMO like yourself? Look, I, I, luckily enough, um, I, so I grew up in marketing at Unilever. Uh, and I was always very lucky to have people, whether they were my bosses or not, many were not, they were just mm -hmm. like informal coaches, many people that invested a lot of time um, teaching me, you know what I mean? Like um, 
And many people that I work with that were like truly inspiring for me, you know. Uh, so remember, like I, I when I my when I got my first job in marketing in 1997, I think uh, I studied mechanical engineer engineering. Like, I didn't know who Philip Kotler was. Uh, like you know, I people if if you ask me what were the four P's, I would have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, and uh, so they they taught me everything uh, I I knew, you know. Like uh, and I think that one advice I have is. Uh, when you start thinking about work, find a place. Uh, like I think that my main driver would probably be like, how much can I learn? You know what I mean? How much can I learn from these people? How much can I learn from this brand, from this company? Uh, uh, because it's a, it's a really good uh, investment. Uh, the, the second thing is like, try to define what you love, you know, like, and what gets you excited. Uh, like I love advertising, I love design, I love marketing, I love internet, the different cultures and how people behave differently depending on the on the product category or the market that, that you are. Like when I go to the supermarkets, uh, when I go to a new country, I love going to the supermarket and looking at everything. Uh, uh, when when I was starting my career, we used to like uh, finish work and go to the house of one of the guys and and, and watch ads because we love that. Uh, and it was not as easy as today that you can go on YouTube and watch. We had to bring a VHS tape, which you probably don't know what it is, like a, <laughs> a cassette like this big uh, to, uh, to watch. So uh, to, to be successful, I think you, you will probably need to work really hard. Uh, and for it not to be painful, you need to be doing something that you like. You know, like, uh, so I, I am completely obsessed about marketing, advertising, creativity, and design. Uh, and, and I have fun uh, uh, with what I do. Uh, and I think life is too short for you to not be learning and not be doing something that you enjoy doing. So that would be my, my best advice. Uh, find a place that you can find places and people where you can learn a lot. I'm still learning. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and find something that you love because that will make the whole journey much more fun and enjoyable. Great. Um... <laughs> So a uh, question just came in uh, from uh, Stu Seltzer, sort of interested in, in that, uh, uh, the merchandising side, right? You've got your hat on, that kind of thing, right? These, these are these sort of adjacencies of business. I happen to know one of our faculty members uh, has been doing some research on uh, Porsche Lamborghini. Um, and I, I know that Porsche, for example, makes in some cases more money from its merchandising. There's like better margin and better profit from the merchandising and the racing than there is from selling the car, right? So that's actually their sort of bread and butter from a profit perspective. How do you guys think about that where, right, it's outside of your core business. What do you do? Where's the brand building in that? How do you think about those kind of, whether it's, you know, merchandising or something else, that added value you can bring to the company from a, a profit perspective? So, to be honest with you, for, for Burger King, we haven't done much, you know, like, and, uh, uh, and there is an opportunity there, you know, like it's just a matter of priorities, you know, like, uh, uh, like we, we are all, I feel that we are always under resourced uh, in terms of people. Uh, I feel that we are always like uh, a very heavy workload with the number of things that we have to do. And we just haven't necessarily prioritized that. In the case of Tim Hortons, to show a, a different example, we actually make uh, com some good money with retail and with items that we sell at the restaurant. If you go, if you go to a Tim Hortons in Canada, you can buy mugs. You can buy, uh, like now that's getting close to the end of the year, like Christmas ornaments. You can buy a bunch of different things which are uh, which are uh, which are branded. But surely there is an opportunity there. I mean, by the way. The, the, we haven't done it consistently. Yeah, this shirt that I'm wearing here, I bought in uh, in Pooh and Bear, which I think it's um, uh, it's a brand that's also it's together with Zara or, don't, or H and M. Don't quote me on that, but I bought in Europe this shirt, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so and it was a partnership that our marketing team in Europe did with Pooh and Bear. Uh, so the, the, we we do it, but it's not something that we do consistently, and there, there is definitely an opportunity to do more of that. 
you, I think you are on mute. That's the, the classic quote of 2000. <laughs> That's, yes, the meme going around now, right? I was uh, typing something for a second and I wanted to make sure. Uh, so uh, one last thought, I guess, you were talking sustainability a lot. There's one, one implementation uh, Joe Plummer, one of our, our adjunct faculty brought up, which is the impossible Whopper, right? Where are you seeing that? Do you seeing these sort of consumer changes? Where is that growing? Because there's, I mean, sustainability elements of that also changing patterns of the consumer and what they're expecting. Right. Um, and where's the success been or where are you getting lessons from that as a, as a closing point? Yeah, we, like, it's, if you want me to talk specifically about impossible and, and plant-based, we are always looking at trends, right? I mean, and seeing where, where the market is going. I, I remember as a Brazilian kid going with my mom on the supermarket to buy milk and we would get to the shelf and there you go, you had milk. Uh, <laughs> when I go to the supermarket today and I try to buy milk, I cannot even find like where milk is. <laughs> so many different types of milk. And, and I think that food will probably evolve that direction. You know, like Impossible, the partnership that we did with Impossible Foods is, is very successful here in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that there was a, 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 a good market for flexitarians meaning people yeah. who eat beef and want to eat maybe a little bit less beef. It's not really for vegans. Ve veganism in the US still relatively small. And 95% of the volume from Impossible is flexitarians. It's not like vegetarian. Yeah. By the way, many people who are vegetarian and, and vegan don't like uh, the Impossible Whopper because it's too much like beef. And it's, it's, eat. Yep, it's too close. Their palate has changed, yeah. Would be exactly, but it, sometimes it's counterintuitive to people. People think like, "Oh, impossible! It's for vegans." No, on the contrary, like vegans usually don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we we launched uh, plant-based burgers with different partnerships uh, uh, with other companies. Uh, impossible Foods today cannot sp export necessarily to Europe, just as an example. So yeah. in Europe, we launched with uh, Unilever and Vegetarian Butcher, which is a brand that they have. Uh, we, we launched in Asia Pacific. We have plant-based burgers today in more than 35 countries. So we are global leaders basically uh, uh, on that segment. And I think it's a segment that will continue to grow. You know what I mean? Like, and we're always looking into uh, like uh, what's next, you know, in terms of the portfolio, because it's good to be a destination for that type of product. You know, it's something that differentiates us and put us ahead of most of the other QSR brands out there. I think it's great. A, a note on the end about thinking about the future, exactly. Um, future from product development, future from consumer behavior. Well, Fernando, pleasure again to see you here, host you. Um, let's all give Fernando a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much. And uh, I bid you adieu. Uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to dip into the rest of this and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Awesome, thank you guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, stay safe and let's connect soon.